Fragments by Demeric. I've been running as long as I can remember, from the deepest caves of the seafoam islands to the darkest pits of the rock tunnel, it has pursued me. No matter what I do, I see it everywhere. Sometimes it will appear just outside of my range of vision. You know the spot I'm talking about. It's that place that exists just somewhere beyond the corner of your eye where everything blurs when you try to look there. You'd think by now that someone as strong as me wouldn't have to worry about such trivial things. Being chased by a Pokemon. For a so-called Pokemon League champion seems pretty pathetic when you think about it. The thing is, though, I don't even know if this thing is a Pokemon at all. I've got as many type advantages lined up as I can imagine needing, save for a ghost type. After my sole experience in the one place in the world that still haunts my dreams, let's just say that I never want to see another ghost Pokemon for as long as I live. The fact remains, though, that I am out of places to run now. If the world's strongest wild Pokemon can't provide a barrier against this thing, then I guess I'm out of luck. There's one real stupid part of this whole situation, though. That's what gets me. It's the fact that, even with all of my accomplishments, I wasn't strong enough to win this time. Since day one of my journey, I've been powerful. I overcame Blue's Squirtle like it was nothing. I powered my way through the Viridian Forest as a newbie trainer, dodging poisonous Beedrill, the paralyzing powder of the Butterfree, and the deadly high-voltage attack of the Pikachu that lived there. I pounded Brock and his rock types into dust with one of my very first Pokémon, a male Nidoran, that by fortune's fate had learned double kick attack just as we exited the forest. I sank Misty's water types with a Bulbasaur that was kindly given to me to look after by a trainer outside of Cerulean City. I bested Lieutenant Sarge in his live wire of a war-born Raichu. When it came down to the line, a Diglett was all that stood between me and a certain defeat there. Sabrina and her psychic types gave me a run for my money, but she too fell against the power of my bond with my Pokémon like breaking waves crashing uselessly against a rocky seashore. Even when I made it to Giovanni, the rotten bastard that headed up Team Rocket in secret, using his gym as a financial conduit to partially fund the criminal syndicate, I tore through his ground types as though I was a tornado unleashed. By this point, my Pokémon and I were nigh inseparable. Nigh unstoppable. We knew what the other was thinking without even having to give commands. Then came the day we began to compete in the Pokémon League. Such tough opponents we met, and they were all worthy foes. I had to admit, I was beginning to sweat in the final rounds against Lance and his Dragonite, yet even they were no match for me. Once I had bested Blue for the final time and had taken my rightful place at the top of the mountain, I knew. There was not a force in heaven or on earth that could touch my Pokémon and I, or so I had thought. With my final adventure into the Cerulean Cave to capture the renegade Pokémon, Mewtwo, I hadn't thought there was any challenge left to be had in the Kanto region. So, when I traveled to Johto and wiped them clean of their gems and badges, I found myself still wanting to test my limits more and more. That's when I heard of it. Rumors of a Pokémon so powerful that it could bend the fabrics of reality itself. I had bested many tough opponents. I had captured Pokémon so rare that they were thought to be mere legends. This, however? This would be my ultimate challenge. With Pokéballs in hand and my team by my side, we went searching for the mysterious Pokémon. For months, we scoured the countryside, carefully picking apart any clues or traces of the creature. For every hint we received, though, only more mystery followed. The strangest thing about all of the information we gathered was that it all seemed to be second-hand. Any of the people I talked to mentioned a friend of a friend whom had gone looking for it. Sometimes they found what they were looking for. Sometimes, however, well, let's just say the details were as varied as opinions on the Pokémon were. I heard it was 80 feet tall. Man, I'd love to go after the thing myself. My friend said her brother described it as shimmering. He disappeared shortly afterwards, though. Yeah, I've heard of it. Supposedly, it only appears to the strongest trainers in the world. I wouldn't go near it. Last I heard, the guy who went after it never came back. Rumor has it that it can change shapes. Pokémon are gentle creatures by nature, but this thing? It's a killer. 
If you want to keep breathing, don't go looking for it. Most of them had the same ring to them. The Pokemon in question was dangerous. On top of that, supposedly, none of the trainers who went after it were ever seen again. While I admit it was beginning to worry me, the challenge was much more tempting. So when I finally got a solid lead, you can bet that I dropped everything I was doing and followed it up. We'd been traveling south from Pallet Town for about two days by sea. My Lapras had always been a strong swimmer, much faster than Blastoise. Together we rode confidently towards the far southern volcanic belt where I had once faced off against Blaine for the Volcano Badge. I gave her a soft rub down along her neck every now and then, just to show my thanks for her work. She always replied in kind by trying to push the pace faster, even if I had told her over and over that there was no hurry. We had something to look into with a solid backstory now. There would be plenty of time to follow it up. Over the last two weeks of information gathering, some of the clues had begun to point to a very specific beach on Cinnabar Island. Along with the newsreels and newspaper clippings reporting missing people in the area, one or two of my leads had directed me there by way of similar stories about trainers on vacation. Trainers who, like the rest, hadn't come home. There was one final piece of information, however, that absolutely captivated my attention. Now, you have to remember that Cinnabar Island was known for its volcanic activity. Based on this assumption, one can further assume that there is a lot of open pits to fall into, given the island's semi-mountainous nature. While that could have explained quite a few of the disappearances, there was one in particular that was marked by such an oddity that it couldn't be so easily explained away. According to the eyewitness reports, just after a trainer had set off running full tilt up the shoreline to go after an unnamed Pokemon, the sky over the beach was ripped apart by a shimmering glow that expanded outwards like a shockwave. When police had arrived on the scene, all they found was the trainer's beach shorts and two very badly damaged Pokeballs. The Pokeballs themselves looked to have been cross-sectioned away. Almost as though someone had taken a die punch and chipped perfect square pieces out of them intently. By the time Lapras and I finally made landfall on the northern shore of the sprawling island, you could say that I was practically chomping at the bit to take my crack at capturing this Pokemon. Anyone with any common sense might think I was crazy. But this is where I'd say that anyone who wouldn't take this chance was crazy. It was the opportunity of a lifetime, not like I hadn't had plenty of them already. So after we checked in at the Pokemon Center and took a short half-day break, we circled the island and came down on the eastern shore. Lapras and I began a search pattern immediately. Up and down the coastline, we scoured for any traces of the mysterious Pokemon. Three days we spent following the same continuous pattern. By day we searched, by night, I curled up next to my beloved water Pokemon on the sandy beach and together, we drifted off to sleep in each other's warm, though sometimes often damp, comfort. On the fourth day, I was about to give up hope. We had just done our 23rd consecutive trip up the shoreline when a cry from the beach rang out and caught my attention. Turning my head swiftly to investigate the source, I saw a group of three beachgoers running in panic down the shore, obviously desperate to get away from something. With a quick pat on her shell, Lapras and I spun on the spot and made a beadrill line for the beach. No sooner had we landed did the sand beneath us begin to quake fiercely. Casting my sight to where the people had been fleeing from, I waited in hesitant anticipation as I stood upon Lapras's shell. The trees near the shore began to tremble themselves. I crouched down, ready to possibly face the mysterious Pokemon I had been searching for. My mouth watered intensely. Every muscle in my body was prepared for this moment. At that moment, in the glistening bright sunshine of the seaside of the island paradise, a Rhydon came bursting from the foliage. We sat there in stunned awe for a moment, not believing my luck. Of all the Pokémon in the world I could have faced, legendary or no, all that commotion came because of a Rhydon? While well, not a particularly common species to the island chain, neglectful trainers were often known for abandoning their Pokemon when they no longer wanted them. It wasn't exactly out of the ordinary, but it also wasn't what I had been hoping for. I sighed heavily, my heart sinking. This wouldn't be a challenge at all. If anything, I'd be doing a public service. I'd already caught and evolved a Rhyhorn, but I couldn't very well leave a rampaging Pokemon in such a highly trafficked tourist location. 
Buckling down with a quick manner, I gave Lapras the signal as I hopped off her shell. She squealed once in acknowledgement before firing off a high-powered water gun. Without even looking, as I was turned away in disgust at the situation, I knew the water gun had hit its target. My girl doesn't miss. Ever. So one can imagine my surprise when I felt the incoming pounding of the rock type. That caught my attention. I spun around in the sand to once more face the charging Pokémon. Though thoroughly soaked from head to toe, it didn't seem phased in the least. Perhaps this one might be worth adding to the collection instead of turning over to the Pokémon Center. If only so, the professor could study its seeming immunity to water. I snapped my hat around to sit backwards, putting on my game face. If this Pokémon wanted a battle, I sure wouldn't disappoint. Alright girl, full force ice beam, hit it! I didn't need to say anything, but it still felt all that much more satisfying to see the beam of glacial energy racing across the scorching sand at our opponent at my command. What came next, I could never have predicted. The Rhyhorn literally split into pieces as the ice beam connected, flying apart in five different sections before coalescing once again into a whole Pokémon. As it did, it gave away the telltale sign I had been looking for. There had been a brief but brilliant flash of something ethereal in its body. Despite it having taken the form of a Rhydon, I had found my mystery Pokémon. Now it was time to get intense. Pokédex in one hand, Pokéball in another, I flipped open the Dexter and aimed it true. No Pokémon data found. I stared down at the red device in my hand, dumbstruck by what the electronic voice had said. Of all the 250-some Pokémon I'd encountered, not one of them registered. I hit the refresh button a couple of times just to make sure the Dex hadn't glitched. No Pokémon data found, it repeated again. The whole time, Lapras had been continually assaulting it with an ice beam, intent on keeping it distracted while I checked it out. I snapped the Pokédex shut, pocketed it, and snapped my fingers. Lapras halted her attack. Take to the waves and give it a surf attack. Lapras, go! Dutifully, my faithful Pokémon dove into the water, dragging along behind her a torrent of foamy wash that doubled in size as she swam out deeper before looping back around. As she came closer to shore, the sand shelf began to bolster the waves up until she was riding atop them. With all four flippers urging the tidal force faster, Lapras came crashing down on top of the Pokémon in a raging flood of salty ocean water, her full weight plus that of the waves bearing down on it. With wide, disbelieving eyes, I watched my girl be tossed aside as though she were a rag doll. The attack never even made contact with the Rhydon imitation. It parted around the rock type as though something had just split the wave in two. Lapras came crashing to the sand, skidding to a halt a dozen feet or so in front of me. I raced up to her, checking to make sure she was alright. Looking no worse for the wear, I gave her a quick embrace before she rounded once more on the thing that had swatted her like a fly. What I saw next, I can't even understand myself. The Rhydon, or whatever it was, started shimmering in a glow that made an evolution pale in comparison. It was beautiful beyond belief. There came a series of warm, pleasant breezes that pulsed off of its shining form that brushed past the two of us like a calm summer's day. That was when it all went south. The glowing Pokémon began to grow and distort. While it never reached the supposed 80 feet tall that some had reported, it grew to a massive height that had me cranking my neck backwards just to look at the whole thing. When the shine faded, I can barely begin to describe what I was looking at. It looked, for all intents and purposes, like someone had banged up an old television screen to the point that it would show nothing but static. Interspersed throughout the static, however, were the strangest shapes and symbols I had ever seen. Even comparing them to the unknown in the elf ruins couldn't come close to matching. These patterns flickered all over its constantly shifting body, if you could even call it that, as various parts of it seemed to fade in and out of existence at random. I had no clue what I was looking at. All I know is that this thing terrified me. I tried the Pokédex on it once more. No Pokémon data. And like that, the Dexter basically exploded in my hand. I reached down with my other, cradling my now injured hand as I dropped the Pokédex. The Pokéball that I had been holding in the other plunked into the sand with nary a sound. 
Without warning, the abomination of a Pokemon loosed a cry. The sound and volume of countless garbled Pokemon voices filled my ears. It was a sound of absolute, abject terror-inducing magnitude. I don't remember if it's then that we decided to flee. I can't recall how far we made it before the noise gave out. All I know is that I was horrified beyond all rational thought. Somewhere in the distance, someone was calling for help. They'd seen it too, but there was nothing to be done now. A tremendous gust of wind blew me off my feet as I fled. I remember being caught out of the air by Lapras, swinging down from her mouth as she left go of my vest. I clung to her neck tightly, all the while hoping just to get away. I didn't even see it coming until it was too late. There was a flash, and another aura erupted down the beach head in front of us. Quicker than lightning, the monster came swooping past, blowing up huge ghosts of sand in its wake. I felt myself go airborne for the second time that day, landing hard on my back in the sand. As I sat up, rubbing my sore head, I could feel the burning pain in my left hand slowly ebbing away from where the dex had practically tried to melt itself to my glove, bringing it down for inspection. I think that's when I started to snap. Just like the damaged Pokeballs I read about, my hand was beginning to float away in tiny, perfectly square glowing fragments that would levitate up and vanish in a shimmering flash of light. I could only stare at it as it kept happening until there was nothing left below the wrist. Somewhere in my mind, a stuck gear clicked and I looked to Lapras. On the beach, my poor Pokemon was suffering the same fate, but to a much greater degree. My hand all but forgotten, I rushed over to my beautiful girl and knelt down to her, placing my head next to hers as before my very eyes, she was being disassembled into nothingness. Together, we stayed like that until the last pieces of my pressure water baby had vanished into thin air. The mysterious Pokemon had disappeared by this point, leaving me alone to try and piece together everything that had happened. I sat there, in something of a mental shock for what felt like hours, looking between where Lapras had just been and at the remaining stump of my left wrist. I know the police came and combed the beach, even running past me now and again like I wasn't even there. Nurse Joy eventually arrived on the scene and retrieved me from my place in the sand. She was a Pokemon healer, but she was also Cinnabar Island's main medical resource as well. I underwent questioning when Officer Jenny eventually came around to the Pokemon Center to see how I was faring, and to deliver what was left of my ruined Pokédex. I don't remember much, but what struck me as odd was that neither of them seemed to realize I was missing my hand. Like it had been gone the whole time. I was still in stunned silence about it, my mind further attempted to try and make sense of what I had seen. Though Officer Jenny tried to ask me what happened, I wasn't there. At least, I think that's the best way to describe it. I spent the next two days on Cinnabar Island attempting to recover from the battle. I didn't eat or sleep, I just sat there in one of the recovery rooms trying to understand. When I did finally manage to find my voice, I think all I did was scream for however long it took me to lose it again to hoarseness. It had taken Nurse Joy's Chansey and two Wigglytuffs singing in concert just to lull me to sleep that night. When I woke the next morning, I at least had enough sense of mind to start asking questions. I spoke with Nurse Joy at length about the attack, but when I tried to explain to her what had happened, I couldn't believe her reaction. You checked in with only five Pokemon when you got here. Charizard, Blastoise, Venusaur, Pikachu, and Snorlax. No Lapras. When we found you on the beach after the Rhydon attacked, you were just kind of stunned. It was as if she had forgotten. I tried to show her my missing hand just to prove my story. She shrugged it off as though it had always been gone. There was no physical damage after all if anyone were to look at it. Just a rounded nub of taut skin where the appendage used to be. It was like it had been surgically removed and skin grafted with such perfection as to have never been disturbed at all. When I tried to have her review the check-in log, my panic rose even further. There were only five Pokémon listed with me. I knew that it couldn't have been faked. The computers were infallible in that respect, unless someone had purposely tampered with the log. The machine checked each Pokéball presented specifically from the Pokémon inside and I know I had turned in all of them for a good rest after the trip to the island. My hands flew to my belt to feel for Lapras's Pokeball, but that too had vanished. 
None of it made any sense. The longer I stared at the log, the less I was convinced that what I was seeing was real. And then I saw it. It was a momentary flicker on the screen, just in the bottom corner, punctuated by the tiniest of sounds through the speakers as its shrill cry wavered in the recesses of the depths of my mind. The mysterious Pokemon was there. I backpedaled so fast I ended up knocking over both Nurse Joy and her Chansey before hitting the ground with a hard slap of flesh on tile. My breath caught in my throat and my heart raced. Nurse Joy asked if I was alright, but my voice was once again lost in my terror. I stood up, keeping an eye on the monitor as I backed away slowly from the computer, never once taking my eyes off of it. When I felt the front door in the Pokemon Center at my back, I spun around and threw the doors open as fast as I could and ran outside into the city. Yet it was there too, flickering in and out of existence just beyond my range of sight down the street, reflected off of a glass storefront. I heard that horrendous cry once again. That was all it took to get me moving. I flew down the streets to the northern coast. Upon reaching the sands, I released Blastoise from his Pokeball, hopped on, and commanded him to get us out of there. I can only imagine the faces of the startled beachgoers on the northern shore as we rocketed out of there, across the water as fast as the Blastoise could take us. Finally, as the island disappeared in the distance, my unease began to settle. We were getting away from that monster. This would be one trainer that would live to tell the tale. From the two days home, I didn't spot the thing a single time. As we pulled into the southern coastline of Palatown, I finally felt a bit more relaxed. Even the complex situation with my missing hand seemed to fade from my mind. Returning Blastoise to his Pokeball home, I immediately took what was left of my Pokedex to Professor Oak. When he saw the burnt-out, half-melted piece of machinery, he could barely believe his eyes. I watched as he hooked up the remainder of the memory core to his computer, trying to find what the Pokemon culprit responsible for destroying his genius invention. The professor spent five hours that day trying to piece together the severely damaged data that the Dex had recorded. For the most part, I sat out in the waiting room of his main office as I continued piecing together the fragments of memory I retained from the incident. He came out part way through his investigation, and I tried to relate to him the things that had happened. I told him everything, from the initial encounter to when one of my best and closest friends essentially evaporated in front of my eyes. Professor Oak took it all in stride, only showing the barest hint of any emotion outside of intrigue when it began to tear up at the still fresh wound in my heart. It wasn't the sympathy one might have expected, though. He wore a look of pure confusion. I'd even tried showing him my hand as well, but like Nurse Joy, he seemed to pass it off as though it had always been gone. When he returned to finish the Pokédex, I remained behind like before. There was nothing I could do but contemplate my experience. I couldn't take it. Just sitting there was going to drive me even more mad if I let it. So, I took it upon myself to see what Oak had dug up out of the remains of my Dex. The cry vibrated all throughout the interior of the lab. I froze on the spot as it did, looking all around for the source in a panic. That is the most peculiar sound I've ever heard. The professor was staring down at his desktop monitor, scrolling through what little data he had managed to retrieve. Along with the sound file of the monster, he managed to glean a little bit of information out of the melted hardware that was my Pokédex. Relaxing only just slightly, I approached the screen and took a look for myself at what it had to say. Pokédex Entry 000, missing no. Height, weight, habitat, footprint, unknown. Cry, sound file recovered. Data, not enough information, Pokédex entry incomplete. Data file, missing no, contains corrupt data, could not extrapolate. What does this all mean? I pondered aloud. Professor Oak continued to ponder the information on his monitor, hand to his chin and thought. Well, from what I can tell, what we have here is a glitch in the Pokédex. What it is telling me is that there is corrupt data in the file that doesn't exist. Well, I personally programmed the Pokédex, even I can't explain this. I checked the police report from Cinnabar Island that was submitted, and something did indeed attack you, but what was it? That's the mystery here. Certainly no Rhydon could have done this to my invention. As if it needed reminding, he waved a hand towards the melted red steel casing of the Dexter. So this missing no, does exist then? I asked. Oak nodded. 
The fact that it's labeled as missing now just means that there's data in the Pokédex that's being saved as free space for backup data, just in case. When you tried to analyze this Pokémon, that extra data space was accessed instead. The Pokédex tried to create an entry based on the data that didn't exist, instead of examining the Pokémon that attacked you. So that's why it exploded then? Quite. It could only have gotten so far if the processor inside overheated from the strain of attempting to complete something in a way that wasn't made to handle. It caused so much of a draw on the system's power unit that the core collected far too much energy. Since that energy couldn't be routed into the desired processes, seeing as the Pokédex isn't meant to create data based on its scans, it was all pooled into one place instead of looping back into the power pack. Oak sighed as he brought the wreckage up to his eye for inspection. The system, though, wound up in a feedback loop trying to both create and analyze data at the same time, continuously trying to draw more power for its processing, and the explosion was the result. Truth be told, even if I had been in my right frame of mind, Professor Oak's long-winded explanation still would have been hard to wrap my head around. Of everything that had come of it, though, at least I had a name for my nightmare now. Missing no. Before I left for the day, Oak provided me with a new Pokédex for continued use in case I ever ran into the beast again. This one, however, had been cleared of all of the backup space needed for the extra data storage. In theory, if I ever ran into Missing No again, the new Dex should be able to classify it a lot easier than the old model had. While the newer model Pokédex was nice, I didn't intend to ever go looking for that bastard again. I had decided to return home to see my mom that night. I was in Pallet Town after all. Surely if anyone who'd realize something was wrong with her son, it'd be my own mother. But just like anyone else, mom didn't seem phased by my missing hand at all. When I asked her about it, she couldn't quite explain it. She was not, however, acting like it was anything out of the ordinary. Nothing I said could convince her that I was missing my hand. It was all too bizarre for me. It seemed there was nothing left to do but retire for the evening. No matter how strange the last week had been, I could do nothing to convince anyone that something was definitely wrong. As I lay in bed, contemplating my position, I found no way to prove anything. Even after searching through family photos that night, I discovered that each and every one of them was missing something. Particularly, the one part of myself I was now staring at. I could not tear my gaze away from the stump of my left wrist as I fell asleep that night. I awoke the next morning to the sound of pots and pans clanging in the kitchen downstairs. Rolling out of bed, I got dressed as quickly as I could, fumbling with any buttons or laces. That would quickly have to change if I was going to continue on like this. I walked downstairs to see my mother busily preparing breakfast for the two of us the way she might have done before I'd set out on my journey some four years prior. It was the calming normalcy of it that kept my mind off the insanity of my situation for the time being as I sat down at the table and vaguely half-listened to the television. The news was broadcasting their usual drivel. There had been nothing of interest according to the news anchor save for one report incident of an out-of-sorts ride-on attack down at Cinnabar Island. I scoffed at that, even as the anchor to relate to the recent story. As mom brought over a plate piled with pancakes, I cast the television for my attention and uneasily settled to begin breakfast, until I heard it. It was the briefest of interruptions, but static flared across the television. By the time I turned to look at the TV, it was as if nothing had happened. Curiously, I kept an eye on the screen to see if it would happen again. After a few moments of peace on the broadcast screen, I returned my attention to the breakfast before me. It flickered again. This time, when I spun to face the television set, I caught just the barest of glimpses before the static cut back to the picture. The shifting symbols were there. Intent not to let my nerves get the better of me, I decided it was nothing. Just a simple flashback. Probably post-traumatic stress. I did lose one of my most favorite Pokémon, not to forget a part of myself. I'd probably be jumping at static for a few weeks to come. Besides that, I'd left that thing far behind on Cinnabar Island. There was no way it could find me here. The TV flickered yet again, just as I turned to continue my breakfast. And with the corner of my eye, there it was. The beast missing no. It was plastered all over the screen for as long as it took me to train my eyes on it, before it vanished once more. Now I knew I wasn't seeing things, 
The bastard had followed me. Without any word of warning, I got up and ran outside into the gloomy light of an overcast day. The wind was blowing in gusts, heralding an incoming storm. If only Mother Nature knew just how right she was. I had to get out of there. Everyone was at risk while I was around. So, I did what anyone would do when they found out that an omnipresent super being bent on their utter destruction was tracking them down like a sportsman in a vulpix hunt. I ran, and I didn't stop running. I couldn't. Everywhere I went, I could see it. Just on the edges of my peripheral vision, it was stalking me. I traced my path through the Kanto region, from back where I had just begun my Pokemon journeys. I hid out in the abandoned power plant outside of Cerulean City for a few days, sequestered myself away in the rock tunnel, thinking that the presence of all those Onyx would keep it at bay. No matter where I went though, it always seemed to get there before me. While making my way back through Cerulean City, I saw a poster for a carnival featuring an all Eevee and Eevee Illusion act. It brought to mind an entry in the Pokédex I had made while in Johto region. Quickly typing it up, I found just what I was looking for. Pokémon 196 Espionon. Data, the Sun Pokémon. It uses the fine hair that covers its body to sense air currents. By reading air currents, it can predict things such as weather or its foe's next move. The tip of its forked tail will quiver when it does. Fortunately for me, I had acquired an Eevee or two during my travels. It would be a small matter to train one up until it's evolved. Stomping by at the Pokemon Center, I had Oak transfer one to me from at the duration of my trip. Let me tell you, I spent the next few weeks getting real close to that Eevee. It would be my saving grace. At least, so I hoped. By the time it had evolved into an Espeon, I had been chased out of every major city in both Kanto and Johto regions by missing no. It seemed to hunt me no matter where I went. Now though, I had an early warning system. Espeon quickly learned how to pick up on missing nose movements. Before I would even realize the bastard was there, my little Espeon would be on top of things and alerting me to its presence. There'd be no way for it to sneak up on me now. For a time, I traveled in relative ease with my newfound companion. Espeon quickly meshed with my team despite him having a lack of significant time to spend with them. After all, we were constantly on the run from the beginning of his stay with us. Through all of it, though, we prevailed and managed to stay ahead of the beast. And that's when you showed up. I thought I could finally relax for a while, even return to the Pokemon League headquarters for a few days, stomping in to see if things had changed there. What do I hear when I do? Some kid trying to work his way through the Johto League to make it to the Indigo Plateau was crushing all opposition just so he could have a shot at me, to be the next Pokemon champion. You know, it'd been so long since I'd even thought about that. How many challengers had come and gone in my absence? How many were waiting in line for their turn at the Great Red of Pallet Town? This was not the time for such confrontations, and I knew it. So I left once again. I abandoned my title. I cannot afford to waste time and efforts on such things anymore. Staying in one place meant death. It meant the end of my existence. I'd told them I'd go train somewhere. Mount Silver sounded like a good place to make my stand, if any. With plenty of high-level Pokémon to give me advanced warning, and Espeon by my side to do that with even greater strength, I doubt the bastard would even make it to me. Surely with enough Pokémon against him, he'll back down eventually. So I set out. I scaled Mount Silver. It took me almost two weeks, but I made it to the top. For a while, things were comfortable. There was ample food to be had from scavenging the forest. I could see for miles around me. Nothing was going to sneak up on me. Not one single solitary thing. And there you were. I had to give you credit, kid. I don't know your name, but I imagine that you'd make one heck of a friend. I've abandoned all of mine save my Pokémon so long ago now that it feels like forever since I came to the top of this mountain. But here you are, staring me down, waiting for the one battle that you won't let be. All because you have to be the very best, just like I did. I give in, knowing that there's no escaping it. I say nothing as the battle begins, standing there with what you'd believe to be one hand in my vest pocket. Tugging my hat over my eyes, saying nothing as my Pokémon beat against yours relentlessly. 
I've said it before, I don't need to give my Pokémon orders. Our bond is too deep for such trivial things anymore. They know what I want, just like I understand them without having to speak their language. As the pitched war rages on, it's almost like I can feel him coming. I might have had a barrier against the strongest wild Pokémon in existence between him and me if you hadn't destroyed them all on your way up the mountain. I don't even have the Espeon to warn me anymore. You saw too that the poor thing is knocked out cold in his Pokéball from the sound thrashing your Typhlosion gave it. The wind whips up around us at the summit of Mount Silver, and still the fight continues until all I have left is my Pikachu. Having had him the longest of any of my Pokémon, it's no surprise that he takes out more than three of yours and a few swift maneuvers. It's down to the wire now. And there he is. You'll never see him. You won't notice him. For that, you should be grateful. He won't be hunting you, my worthy foe. He's here for me. As Pikachu goes tumbling into the snow-crusted mountain beneath us, laying at my feet, I humbly accept my defeat. I say nothing as you turn around and begin to hike back down the mountain, seeing a harbinger of my destruction materialize out of thin air like a phantom that I just can't seem to understand the rhyme or reason of. As I watch your retreating form through the shapeless mass, I can't help but wonder, if I had been satisfied with that final victory, would I be here now? Just for the sheer want of any kind of explanation why, I pull the new Pokédex out of my pocket, flip it open, pointing it at missing no. No Pokémon data found, it droned in its casual robotic voice. Closing my eyes, the Pokédex as well, I felt that familiar tingling numbness begin to creep over my body. I wonder, what's it going to be like? That was Fragments. Final thoughts? Fantastic story. From start to finish, this story was all around very well done. It gets the plot started fairly early in the story to get you interested, the middle of the story never goes back to something mundane, and a great twist comes near the end that's fully fleshed out and very accurate. This is one of those stories that did so much well that it's almost difficult to say what's good about it at length. If you're at home writing a creepypasta, this is one of the ones you might want to look at for inspiration, especially if you want to make an effective story in the Pokémon universe that still manages to stay true to the games they're based off. In fact, this may even be the first story I've read that's managed to do that. One problem I have to bring up though, because this does crop up once in the story. I said it last week, and I've said it many times in the past, and I'll say it again. Action scenes are not creepy. Having graphic Pokémon battles in a story where Pokémon actually exist and are doing battle rather than in a game don't add anything to the story and should be kept as short as possible or removed altogether. Also, I believe I've found a rather big plot hole and I hope the author has an explanation for it as the story itself doesn't give it any kind of reasoning. It's made clear to us that when missing no attacks, it wipes its target from existence. That's why there's no record of Lapras, and everyone thinks that Red never had a hand. If that's so, how could the reports of trainers going missing happen? If missing no did truly attack them, no one would remember they ever existed, thus meaning no news reports, and nothing to start the whole chain of events. That aside, I very much enjoy this story and look forward to seeing what other stories Demeric makes. That's it for this week's Creepypasta. Tune in again next week when we tackle yet another story made and sent in by the fans with Dark to Light. If you want to write your own story, help peer edit a story, or even just read the stories early, check out the description where you'll find a link to the Creepypasta section of my forum. You'll also find a link to the playlist of every Creepypasta reading I've done. Remember that if you want your story read on the show, you must stay active on your post on the forum, as well as read the forum rules. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, sweet dreams.